a recent quiz we had up on our Flight Insight app, where you can do weekly quizzes joined by thousands of pilots, was all about airspace. In true Flight Insight fashion, we don't just ask rote questions though, but try to set up realistic scenarios where you'll have to make real decisions based on your airspace knowledge. Let's dive in. You've got a free afternoon and want to do some pattern work in Morgan County. Visibility is good at over 10 miles, but the clouds are a bit low. The traffic pattern altitude is 1800 MSL. What minimum ceilings do you need in order to do your pattern work? Let's have a look at the sectional chart. Morgan County is there, I-71. This is an airspace question, so what airspace are we going to be in? Morgan County is a non-towered airport, and we don't see any Class B, C, or D airspace on this chart at all. These shaded lines, called vignettes, bound areas where it's Class G from the surface up to 700 AGL, and Class E above that. Outside those areas, which is where we find our airport, have the Class G go up to 1200 AGL, which is where Class E takes over. So what airspace is pattern altitude in? We need to be careful about AGL and MSL here. The field elevation is 1000 MSL. Pattern altitude is 1800 MSL, so this is 800 AGL. Class G airspace goes from the surface to 1200. So in the pattern, we're in Class G airspace. So what are the weather minimums in Class G airspace? First, we have to specify that we're talking about daytime flight, which the question tells us we are because it mentions a free afternoon. Then, of course, we're looking at flight below 1200 AGL. Class G airspace above 1200 AGL is pretty rare, so I always think of the mainline Class G's, daytime below 1200 AGL. That's the important one to remember. It's one statute mile of visibility with the requirement to stay clear of clouds. There's no minimum cloud clearance, either below, above, or horizontally separated from them. So at pattern altitude of 1800 MSL, the clouds only need to be at 1801 MSL or above, just high enough for us to be clear of them. Not the most safe, maybe, but you do sometimes hear this kind of logic at flight schools in non-towered airports, where if they're looking to do pattern work, they just make sure visibility is at least a mile and clouds are above pattern. Should you have an SOP with more restrictive minimums? Well, that's up to you. Next question, you're flying into Elmira. When should you contact approach? So let's look at the airspace around Elmira. It has two concentric circles around it, which immediately make us think of Class Charlie airspace with its inner and outer areas. The color is a bit off though. Charlie airspace is shown with magenta lines. These are more of a blue gray. And the giveaway is the note that Elmira is a TERSA, Terminal Radar Service Area. These are pretty rare nowadays. The best way to think about them is that they're a voluntary Charlie area with a mandatory delta. You can call Elmira Approach for voluntary radar services for help sequencing in and out, but you don't have to. You do have to establish two-way radio communication with Elmira Tower to enter the delta shown by the traditional segmented circle, just like you would for any delta. So the answer is, we don't need to contact Approach. Okay. Now we're over flying KNJW at 7,500 feet. We're at 210 knots indicated with a 50 knot tailwind. Do we need to slow down? This is testing your knowledge of speed restrictions. First of all, what class airspace are we in? NJW is a towered field. It's class delta up to 3,000 feet, but we're at 7,500. So it's class echo. Class Echo airspace below 10,000 MSL has a maximum speed of 250 knots. Okay, well we're at 210 on the airspeed indicator. With the tailwind, our ground speed is 260 knots. Is the restriction in airspeed or ground speed? And if it's airspeed, is it true airspeed or indicated? 91.117 clearly specifies that the restriction is an indicated airspeed of no more than 250 knots, so our indicated airspeed of 210 even with the extra push from the wind, means we don't have to slow down. Next, we're outside the Philly Bravo and call approach saying our tail number, position, and our request to enter. The controller responds, November 123 X-Ray Charlie, Philadelphia approach, I have your request. Can you enter the Bravo? The requirement to enter Bravo airspace is a specific clearance to do so. Unlike Class C and D airspace, where two-way radio communication is all that's required, we need to hear the magic words cleared into class Bravo. Controllers will often say, I have your request or clearance on request to let you know that they're working on getting you in. 
They may need to coordinate with another sector so they can't just immediately let you in. Question five, what's the difference between controlled and uncontrolled airspace? So we often hear that class A, B, C, D, and E are controlled, while class G is uncontrolled. But what does that mean? Usually you need to be in communication with ATC in controlled airspace, but not always. There's no communication requirement for VFR aircraft in class E. Also, weather minimums are typically stricter the higher up the class schedule you go, but once you get to Bravo, they actually relax a bit. In class C and D, you have to stay at least 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and 2,000 feet horizontally separated from clouds. But in Bravo, you just have to stay clear of them. So the difference is just that IFR aircraft have to be on an IFR clearance with a flight plan in order to be in controlled airspace. When you, as a VFR aircraft, are in controlled airspace, even if you're not talking to anyone, like in Class E, all IFR aircraft will have their separation provided for by the ATC system, as well as their requirement to see and avoid VFR guys like you. Let's move on to some bonus questions. You can get bonus questions if you opt to share our quizzes with your friends via email or social media. Let others join in the fun. Why are there areas southwest, southeast, and northeast of Salisbury Airport where Class E begins at the surface? Salisbury is a Delta Airport with the blue segmented circle indicating as such. Three areas denoting Class E to the surface are found around the airport. You'll notice that they sit under the extended center lines of some runways there. The airspace is protected on the approach to these runways to allow controlled airspace to go all the way down to the surface and allow aircraft on approaches to still enjoy ATC separation standards low enough to break out of the clouds and land. Elsewhere, the Class E starts at 700 or 1200 AGL, and this is higher than the minimum altitudes on many of these approaches. Final question. What airspace are you assured to have all aircraft legally required to have ADS-B out capabilities? For those of us going through the ADS-B mandate for our aircraft or remembering the rush to get compliant by the year 2020, it's tempting to say it's required everywhere. But the reality is that ADS-B, like Mode C transponders, is only required in certain airspace. Most Class E airspace is exempted from this. The lesson? Watch out in this airspace as there can and will be some aircraft not broadcasting on ADS-B that you won't be able to spot on your onboard traffic. Okay, that's it for this quiz. Hopefully this deep dive answers a lot of questions. Sign up to our newsletter at the link in the description or in the comments to get notified of a new quiz each Monday, as well as to stay up to date on everything else we're doing at Flight Insight.